Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, okay. good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are connecting from. Welcome to the 20th High Level Alliance Conference Against Trafficking in Persons, hosted by the OSCE. I'm Valiant Ritchie, OSCE Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. This year, we are obviously gathering in a different format for reasons we don't need to be reminded of. Uh, to adapt to the circumstances, we have gone online while maintaining an in-person component here in the Hofburg in Vienna. And I'm glad to see participants connecting from all over the OSC region and beyond. We have several hundred already uh, joining us online. And uh, this year, we are delighted to see uh, double the registrations of years past in the Alliance Conference. So a tremendous engagement from all across the OSC region. Uh, I'm also delighted that uh, many others are joining the live stream, uh, which is also now running. This really shows the supplemental value we can bring and the new audience we can connect with by expanding these conversations online. Uh, so a heartfelt welcome to everyone for joining us. Before getting started, allow me to make a few brief technical announcements. I'd like to thank all participants in the room for silencing your phones in advance. For those online, please ensure that your microphone is muted and your camera is disabled at all times except when taking the floor. This will allow everyone to follow the discussions without disturbance. You all, both in the room and on Zoom, can register to ask questions to our panelists and deliver short statements. Registrations are recorded with our colleague, Alexander Kirilenko. He is here in the room with us, or you can send a message to floor request in the Zoom chat box. Please specify your name and surname, as well as your country or state representatives or the organization you are representing for civil society and international organizations. Please also make sure that you indicate the session during which you would like to deliver your statement. If your intervention is longer than two minutes, we encourage you to send your written statement to info-cthb at osce.org and we will circulate it. Hopefully you can follow all this information on the slide that is on your screen right now. And don't miss the conversation on Twitter, at OSC underscore CTHB, hashtag Ask OSCE Alliance. As is customary for the Alliance Conference, the meeting is live streamed and will be recorded. Also tomorrow afternoon, there will be a few mobile cameras around the premises to capture some additional images without sound. Finally, we set up a virtual presentation table for participants online wishing to share materials with the wider audience. If you want to contribute materials to the virtual ex exhibition table, please send an email to info-cthb at osc.org. Now, without further ado, let's kick off this 20th Alliance Conference. My name is Coco Berthman, and statistically I should not be speaking to you. Statistically, I should be a drug addict, a prostitute. Statistically, I should be dead. I, however, am the founder and president of the Coco Berthman Scholarship Fund, an organization that provides human trafficking survivors with scholarships to higher education worldwide. I am an aspiring international human rights attorney and I have made it my goal to work in the jurisdictional part of counter-human trafficking efforts. I said that I statistically shouldn't be speaking to you because I am a survivor of human trafficking, in particular familial trafficking. I was able to escape over 10 years ago. Most individuals do not understand what human trafficking and child trafficking entails. I was hidden in plain sight. I went to school in the morning, I had dance classes in the afternoon and went horseback riding. My life seemed normal, but when the doors to my home closed, everything changed. I was raped 10 to 50 times a day by individuals from all segments of society, people we trust on a daily basis. Being born into exploitation, I did not understand that what is being done to me is abuse and trafficking. I had to learn through an American TV show what abuse and child trafficking really meant and that I needed to escape. After learning the shocking and sickening statistics about human trafficking and modern slavery, I have chosen to share my personal experiences publicly so we can bring more awareness on the trafficking in human beings worldwide. In 2018, the Global Slavery Index estimated over 40 million victims worldwide in human trafficking situations. Out of 2,300 cases, only one will be prosecuted. 
the conviction rates are even lower. I am here testifying that those numbers are too low. My perpetrators have also not been prosecuted or convicted. Human trafficking is a $53 trillion enterprise and yet only $125 million are invested each year to combat trafficking in human beings. This is not enough. Survivors of human trafficking deserve to be heard and listened to and believed. This is what justice means to me, to be believed and hurt and to be supported. I firmly believe there's two major points that need to change in the legal system to serve survivors of trafficking in human beings better. First, we must implement a curriculum in all educational systems worldwide that will teach children, youth, and young adults about abuse and trafficking so that if they find themselves in a situation, they understand right away if it needs to be reported. Second, we must implement a mandatory training for all law enforcement agencies on the neurology of complex trauma and PTSD so that individuals working with survivors understand the trauma and the complexity of recollection of memory. Since earning an additional degree in forensic psychology, I understand a lot of cases are not being prosecuted because of the misunderstanding law enforcement has in survivors and the complexity of trauma. If we want to serve survivors of human trafficking better, we must invest in the training of law enforcement agents so that they understand the neurology of the brain and the complexity of trauma. We have more slaves today than ever before in history. We must not be silent on this anymore. We must teach children early on and choose to have the difficult conversations. It cannot be that children and victims of exploitation to commercial sex have to learn through TV shows that what is being done to them is wrong. We must put out the signal that there is hope, there is help, and there is healing. Justice to me means to be believed and heard. Perpetrators need to understand that their actions and crimes will be punished to the full extent of the law. Now, what does it mean to be prosecuted, convicted, and punished to the fullest extent of the law? Right now, it doesn't mean really much. The punishment needs to match the crime. As a survivor of human trafficking, I testify that those crimes are the most horrific crimes one can do to another human being. We need to prosecute perpetrators of human trafficking rather than the survivors. We need to use trauma-informed interviews, and we must believe survivors. My name is Coco Berthman. I'm from a well-developed industrial country with a high educational system. Escaping human trafficking does not mean surviving human trafficking. We survivors are being given the life sentence, while in fact, this burden should be on the perpetrators on those crimes. I have not chosen to be a victim of human trafficking, but I'm choosing every day to fight the biggest human rights challenge of the century. I invite you to choose the same. She says justice to me means to be believed and heard. At its core, this conference is about those words, truly listening to victims and survivors seeking justice on their behalf and holding accountable those who would do harm. By attending this conference, you've chosen to listen to what justice means to the victims and survivors of trafficking and to discuss how to better deliver justice and end impunity. This year, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Palermo Protocol, which gave us the first internationally agreed definition of human trafficking. And so this year, within the OSCE's 4P framework, prevention, prosecution, protection, and partnership, we are placing a special emphasis on prosecution. This is not to overshadow the other piece. On the contrary, this emphasis can help build stronger and mutually reinforcing pillars to tackle this crime from all angles. And it reaffirms the principle that a strong rule of law must be a fundamental cornerstone in our collective strategy. For without this, what hope and comfort can we offer to Ms. Bertham and all the other victims? There's also a very practical reason for this emphasis on prosecution. Although many countries now have legislation and action plans to combat trafficking, impunity remains widespread across the OSC region. It's estimated there are some 25 million victims of human trafficking globally. Yet in 2019, just a little more than 11,000 traffickers were prosecuted, 
roughly one prosecution for every 2,154 victims. As you just heard, Ms. Berthman says, perpetrators need to understand that their actions and crimes will be punished to the full extent of the law. But the data show that most traffickers will never spend a day in jail, let alone a courthouse, let alone prison. Indeed, we are not even close to prosecuting traffickers at a rate that would make this crime risky for the perpetrators. Moreover, not only is the scale of our response lacking, but one recent report indicates there is a, that since 2015, there has been a 50% decline in the number of prosecutions for human trafficking in Europe and a staggering 75% decline in prosecutions of trafficking for labor exploitation. So why are we falling short? Is it lack of funding or lack of capacity? Is it lack of political will to address the issue? Is it inadequate legislation? Or is it all of the above? Exploring solutions to these questions will be the focus of the next three days. As a starting point, we have some excellent guidance and political consensus on what needs to be done in the 2003 OSCE Action Plan, its addenda, and other MC decisions. These documents evince a commitment to tackle this issue through a set of clear and far-reaching strategies and tactics. These include, for example, the criminalization of all forms of human trafficking with penalties proportionate to the serious nature of the crime, as Ms. Berthman just said. They also include provisions for effective access to justice for victims as well as victimless prosecution by encouraging investigators and prosecutors to build cases without relying exclusively on victim testimony. The establishment of specialized units, the strengthening of cross-border and multi-agency cooperation, and the use of tools like financial investigations are all elements already identified in the OSCE decisions as crucial ingredients in the fight against trafficking in human beings. However, full implementation remains unrealized. Thus, we will be engaging on all of these topics beginning today as part of our effort to support participating states in turning these commitments into durable action. But for these efforts to be effective and impactful, states need to invest and be committed to fostering justice. The citizens of the OSCE are counting on us to ensure their safety and security, as well as their fundamental rights. And victims of this crime are asking us to listen to and support them. Justice should never be this hard or this elusive. That is why we are here. For the next three days, let us rise to meet the moment. Now, before giving the floor to the opening and keynote speakers who will be addressing you shortly, let me give you a few elements about the program of this conference. After the opening session and a short intermission, panel one will seek to provide a general overview of the state of affairs and a better understanding of the multitude of factors contributing to the low rates of prosecution. Tomorrow afternoon, panel two will feature some of the innovative measures and existing promising practices anti-trafficking investigators and prosecutors can adopt to overcome the obstacles to prosecuting human trafficking. This is about supporting participating states in working not only harder, but also smarter. In panel three, we will discuss the application of the victim-centered and trauma-informed approaches to investigation and prosecution. This is a crucial discussion on how to uphold and support human rights at the same time that we aim to foster safety and security. And finally, panel four on Wednesday, will outline recommendations on how laws and policies can best contribute to having more uh, numerous and more effective prosecutions. The objective will be to highlight ways to address the challenges mentioned in previous panels and enhance the implementation of the Palermo Protocol and relevant OSC commitments. As per OSC tradition, in the program of the conference, we have included side events organized by our partners. This year, we have two side events which will take place exclusively online. The first one will take place tomorrow morning, Vienna time, and is organized by the Transnational Threat Department's Strategic Police Matters Unit and the High Commission on National, Commissioner on National Minorities, and it will explore community policing as an effective way to build cohesive and resilient societies and to prevent and combat human trafficking. Then tomorrow evening, we will hear from ODIR, the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights and UN Women about the findings of a policy survey they recently conducted on the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic on human trafficking and the recommendations emerging from this survey. And I can tell you, I've seen early drafts of the recommendations and they are really excellent. And I encourage you to consider them. And finally, a few words of thanks 
to the panelists and speakers who have agreed to share their exp expertise with us in the course of these three days. Each of these experts and practitioners will offer unique insight and guidance for states to step up their efforts to prosecute offenders and eradicate human trafficking at the national, regional, and international levels. And most importantly, allow me to thank Sean, Kira, Carly, Ivan, Michal, Malika, and Coco, the survivors who will be uh, represented through videos throughout the conference over the next three days. With their messages presented, they will remind us why, in fact, we are here. The impact of traffickers and users have on victims can last a lifetime. And yet, as you will see, these men and women demonstrate courage, perseverance, and humanity. Their words are often difficult and they challenge us to do better. While it is not always easy to listen, I hope we can find inspiration in their words and answer their call for action. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me now introduce our first distinguished guest. Sander Leshai is Minister of the Interior of the Republic of Albania and heads the ministry that is responsible for coordinating anti-trafficking efforts in his country. Mr. Minister, we have built a robust cooperation with Albania on a number of activities, both this year and before, from child trafficking to building national simulation-based exercises. We are honored to have you here and sir, the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Ritchie, thank you for giving the floor and it's a great pleasure to be here so virtually with you today. I'm very pleased to address today the opening session of the 20th Conference of the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons. 2020 marks as well as the 20th anniversary of Palermo Convention against transnational that affects us all, and no OEC member state is immune from this heinous crime. Albanian chairmanship has rendered combating human trafficking one of its, its main priorities. Almost 25 million persons are estimated to suffer from this degrading crime. According to UNODC latest global report on trafficking in persons. Globally, countries are detecting and reporting more victims. This can be the result of increased capacity to identify victims or and an increased number of trafficked victims. However, only within Europe, despite the rise in the victim identification by 51% prosecution of perpetrators suffered a decrease of 52%, thus reflecting a considerable gap in impunity across the OSCE region compared to the magnitude of the crime. When the rule of law is threatened, the security and safety of all citizens, especially the most vulnerable, is at stake. Criminal investigation and legal punishment of the perpetrators of crimes of, of trafficking in human beings are of paramount importance. Sold imprisonment of traffickers is not sufficient. Trafficking works as a criminal business model. Success in the fight against it depends heavily on an integral approach which aims to strike on all the elements that make up its cycle. Addressing factors that drive supply and demand in this criminal business, building sufficient capacity to prevent and fight trafficking, increasingly relying on intelligence, national and international coordination are permanent elements of a recipe for success in the fight against organized crime in general and against human trafficking in particular. Human trafficking is at its core a vast profitable crime. It is estimated that the total illegal profits obtained from the use of forced labor worldwide amount to about 150 billion per year, 150 billion US dollars. 
depletion of finances that aid crime, and especially confiscation of properties and other assets generated by criminal activity remains the best path leading to long-term success. We will be able to believe that we have substantially cracked down on crime only when we can indiscutably and resolutely confiscate both the money and other assets generated by it. Confiscation would be the effective vaccine. Confiscation, a company with conviction, does not only deliver justice, but also send the right message to those who aspire to get involved in trafficking in the future. Confiscation could make the fight against the crime sustainable and credible. Certain on the effectiveness of this approach, in Albania we have entered a new and important phase in the fight against organized crime, which is strongly based on the ambition to go after the money and assets created by it. A law passed early this year has given to the law enforcement authorities a new instrument in the fight against crime in general and uh, human trafficking in, in particular. Anyone previously been convicted of a particular set of criminal activities, which undoubtedly includes trafficking in human beings, must prove the legality of the origin of his assets before the special court against organized crime and corruption. And not only that, all persons sub subject to this law are excluded from the right to obtain public contracts, as well as a number of permits or licenses enabling business activity in various economic sectors. Since the beginning of this year, the most prominent crime representatives have a new and a very big problem. They must prove in a court that they have had sufficient and lawful in income for their assets accumulated over the years. This demand, which they had never expected, has created a stern surprise for them. At the same time, it has sent a very important message. Criminal property is not safe whatsoever. Thus far, hundreds of assets have been seized by the court during these months, and many, and many more others are in line. Further, Albania is implementing a comprehensive and thorough justice reform that will consolidate and ensure independence, impartiality, accountability, and professionalism of the judiciary. The country is showing increasing efforts in sentencing convicted traffickers to significant prison terms, identifying more victims, and providing robust training for relevant officials. The government has increased its funding for a national anti-trafficking coordinator and maintains a multidisciplinary working group of a separate task force to develop and monitor anti-trafficking policies. In cooperation with our international partners and with civil society organizations, we have established an advisory board of victims of trafficking consisting of three survivors. Albania is implementing also the cause, called cause, meaning confiscated assets used for social experimentations, a new initiative in Albania and Western Balkans. The cause aims to create a good model of a sustainable reuse of confiscated organized crime assets through the establishment of social enterprises by civil society organizations. Today, we have three social enterprises in Albania which enable victims of organized crime and human trafficking to reintegrate into society and also contribute to a rise, rising awareness of the local community in the fight against organized crime and the phenomenon of human trafficking. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the OSCE has a unique and very comprehensive set of commitments on combating trafficking of human beings and on prosecution in particular, as it provides a unique platform for coordination in anti-trafficking efforts, sharing best practice, practices, and tailor-made expertise. We have the mechanisms, the partnerships, and the goodwill to end impunity and increase protection for victims of trafficking. Thank you for your attention. Minister Lesha, I thank you so much for your words, uh, an impressive and commendable uh, number of initiatives in Albania, including uh, following the money, which uh, certainly is excellent to see. Uh, there's few indignities so severe as um, exploiting persons and then profiting off of it, much less um, having impunity about it. So I, I applaud Albania's efforts in this regard and for addressing the supply and the demand and promoting the uh, international cooperation. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. In my office, we believe in the value of partnerships in order to multiply and amplify our efforts, and that is why I'm honored to welcome uh, Ms. Khada Wali, uh, UNODC Executive Director, who uh, was able to join us today in person. Ms. Wally, it's an honor to have you here and a real pleasure. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Val. Minister Leshai, uh, Ambassador uh, Hassani, and um, dear distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Oops. Let me remove this. It's a pleasure to be back at the OSCE, this time for the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons. I thank Val Ritchie, the OSCE Special Representative on Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for organizing this important event. Far too often the exploitation uh, and abuse of people for profit goes unpunished. The COVID-19 crisis and economic downturn are leaving more women, men and children at risk of being trafficked. I welcome this meeting to end the impunity, protect the vulnerable, and stop this crime. The Alliance represents a valuable platform, bringing together international and regional organizations with civil society partners in the fight against human trafficking. The OSCE helped to pioneer this multi-stakeholder approach with the launch of the Alliance in 2004. This experience served the OSCE well when it became the first regional multilateral organization to co-chair the Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Person or ICAT for 2019-2020. As the standing coordinator for ICAT, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has welcomed the OSCE's support in promoting synergies and harmonized approaches to support member states to enhance legislation and criminal justice capacities to end impunity for traffickers. In this context, I very much welcome the inclusion of tracking in person into the priorities of Albania's 2020 OSCE chairmanship. At UNODC, we are currently preparing an institutional strategy to be finalized by the end of the year, as well as a strategic vision for Africa 2020-2030, in which the fight against trafficking in persons will be positioned as an important area of expansion. Facilitating law enforcement and criminal justice cooperation, promoting victim-centered responses focused on women and youth, and improving the world's knowledge on trafficking trends are among key dimensions which will be develop we will be developing. Today's meeting is timely as evidence is mounting that the COVID-19 crisis has, has further increased vulnerabilities and compounded traffic risks as highlighted in the ICAT call to action issued in response to the pandemic in April. Some 60% of the world's students are still affected by school closures and the equivalent of 400 million full-time jobs were lost. In the Women and young people are among the worst affected by the crisis. Almost 40% of all employed women work in hard hit sectors, according to ILO, and women are more often employed in the informal sector without social protection. Almost 77% of the world's young workers are in the informal jobs. Women and girls also account for more than 70% of detected trafficking victims, and 30% of those are children. The increase in screen time and online interactions are creating occasions for traffickers to find, contact, and exploit victims through online channels. 
At the same time, rising poverty and fewer opportunities in the COVID-19 economic downturn threaten to leave many more people at the mercy of human traffickers. The nexus between poverty, organized crime, and human trafficking is becoming increasingly evident, and UNODC research points to learnings from past economic recessions which resonate as warnings in today's context. UNODC analysis of trafficking dynamics during and after the 2008 global financial crisis found increases in cross-border human trafficking from countries <coughs> that experienced the hardest and longest falls in employment. On the other hand, countries that recovered faster saw fewer outflows of victims. Governments need to step up action to prevent exploitation in the COVID-19 crisis to identify and support trafficking victims and bring perpetrators to justice. The UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and its Trafficking Protocol have supported progress on these fronts for the past two decades. Since the protocol's entry into force, more and more victims are being detected. <clears throat> Data collected by UNODC in its role as guardian of the protocol shows a clear link in more than 40 countries between the introduction of anti-trafficking measures and increase in victim detection. Such measures have also led to more trafficking convictions. The share of countries recording no convictions for trafficking in persons declined from 40% to 9% between 20, 2003 and 2017. The conviction rates, however, are still very, very low in many countries. We look at the OSCE and its region as reliable partners to reinforce efforts to end the impunity of traffickers and secure convictions. UNODC's extensive technical cooperation program supports countries in building the required expertise and strengthening prosecutions. UNODC has been present in southeastern Europe since the early 1990s and is currently working on the basis of the regional program for the period 2020-2023, which includes a component on trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. By helping to establish networks of criminal justice practitioners, including prosecutors, national coordinators, and anti-money laundering officials, we are increasing knowledge and information sharing about transnational crime syndicates and facilitating cooperation on current cases. One of the most notable achievements of this cooperation was the arrest of perpetrators and the rescue of child trafficking victims in France following a 2018 meeting between French, Romanian, and Bosnian investigation teams which enabled them to exchange critical information. <clears throat> UNODC is also assisting law enforcement authorities in Central Asia to develop standard operating procedures and police training. We will be further strengthening our support with the placement of a regional anti-human trafficking advisor in our office in Tashkent later this year. Furthermore, our office pro produces legislative guidance material and anal anal analyzes good practices in prosecuting trafficking. Victims of human trafficking are often also compelled to commit crimes in connection with their victimization. Guidance to criminal justice practitioners and victim-centered approaches are crucial to ensure we punish traffickers, not victims. UNODC resources for practitioners include the Human Trafficking Knowledge Portal, gathering information on more than 1,500 cases from more than 100 different jurisdictions globally. Cases from this database are being used in UNODC technical assistance activities, such as capacity building training in the criminal justice sector conducted in 14 countries in Southeastern Europe and Central Asia. The knowledge portal is powered by the electronic platform Sherlock, to which the OSCE contributes data for its region. Looking ahead, we will be organizing a joint event together focused on responses to trafficking for sexual exploitation in Southeastern Europe scheduled to be held in Croatia in October. This October, we will also hold the 10th session of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, where the new review mechanism for the convention will offer a valuable opportunity to assess and address challenges in the protocol's implementation. At the ICAT principles meeting in November, we will have the opportunity under the OSCE co-chairpersonship <coughs> to advance a common vision for ICAT to support coordinated anti-trafficking responses, leveraging our respective expertise and mandates. This will build on the good work we have been doing together on key issues, such as trafficking risks in global supply chains and the impact of technology on trafficking. We will also be submitting this month at the request of the European Union, our joint ICAT input to the new EU anti-trafficking strategy. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to continuing our strong cooperation with the OSCE through ICAT 
and the alliance to help states and end the impunity of traffickers and offer protection and assistance to victims. Last Friday, Secretary General Greminger and I signed the 2020-2022 Joint Action Plan. The plan will further advance our anti-trafficking work and keep this priority high on the international agenda as we work towards the General Assembly's appraisal of the Global Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Persons in 2021. Before concluding, I would like to mention that next week, on July 30, we will be marking the World Day Against Trafficking in Person. This year, UNODC is launching a campaign that highlights the role of frontline actors in identifying victims and supporting them on their path to justice. We will also use this opportunity to promote the UNODC's managed UN Voluntary Trust Fund for Victims of Trafficking in Persons, which has provided assistance to 3,500 victims a year through civil society partners, including in Serbia, Moldova, and Ukraine. I urge OSCE participating states to contribute to the fund and its good work. I hope that you will join our advocacy effort <coughs> on the World Day, and I look forward to continuing our mutual support and work together to end human trafficking and achieve justice for victims. I do want to reiterate Val's commitment to Coco Berthman and many other victims. There is hope, there is help, there is healing to victims, and we will be working very seriously to achieve that. This is my commitment and UNODC's commitment. I wish you all a successful event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Swale. Uh, we are pleased to count uh, UNODC as one of our closest partners in this area, and I can tell you that uh, the cooperation with your office, including through ICAT, uh, has been highly rewarding for us and allowed us to advance our common priorities in a number of areas, including, as you mentioned, the nexus between trafficking and technology, uh, as well as the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Uh, we look forward to deepening this collaboration in the future. Thank you so much for your comments. One of the main features of the OSCE is its comprehensive approach to security, which translates into a wide set of activities and this is why participating states have entrusted a number of executive structures with a mandate on trafficking. One of these structures is the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, or ODIR. We are delighted that ODIR's first deputy director has contributed opening remarks to this conference by video, which I would now ask my team to play on your screen now. A very good morning to all of you. Let me begin by thanking you, dear Val, and your office for organizing the 20th Annual Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons Conference. Despite the current pandemic circumstances, I am glad to see that this important forum for exchange, cooperation, and coordination can continue this year. May I also say that we at ODIR greatly value the good cooperation with your office in this and other endeavors. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this year's focus on ending impunity, delivering justice through prosecuting trafficking in human beings is most relevant. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how human traffickers are exploiting the situation to boost their criminal activities and profits, and often face very few consequences for their crimes. But impunity for trafficking in human beings is not new. Impunity persists because trafficking in human beings is a high profit crime which carries low risk. This highly gendered crime generates more than 150 billion US dollars a year, with two thirds of all profits derived from trafficking of women and girls for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Yet, the number of detected victims, while growing in recent years, still constitute less than 1% of the total estimated number of all trafficked women, girls, men, and boys. And the identification often does not result in more investigation. The rate of prosecuting traffickers remains low and successful convictions even lower. Impunity persists because implicit or explicit bias, prejudice, stigmatization, gender stereotypes, and other such factors continue to negatively impact the detection and identification of women and girls trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. 
these biases need to be addressed at all levels by governments, international organizations, NGOs, and especially by law enforcement. Impunity persists because traffickers use methods of subjugation and control which are often enough to ensure the long-term or even lifelong silence of victims and survivors. Impunity finally persists because traffickers are able to avoid justice and detection by constantly evolving and adapting their modus, modus operandi. For example, the COVID-19 pandemic has put into spotlight how traffickers are increasingly using the internet to groom, recruit and exploit human beings, especially women and children. This and other trends in the context of the pandemic are addressed in policy recommendations that ODR and UN Women have recently developed together based on data collected from survivors of trafficking and from frontline service providers. Let me take this opportunity to invite you to a side event tomorrow at 6 p.m. where we will present and discuss the key findings with a panel of global anti-trafficking experts. Ladies and gentlemen, it is paramount to foster coordinated, multi-level cooperation, including survivor leaders, as set out in recent Ministerial Council decisions, to address the crime of trafficking with a human rights-based, gender-sensitive, and victim and survivor-centered approach. A comprehensive and fully functional national referral mechanism is essential to facilitate the trauma-informed work of the criminal justice sector and other relevant actors. It ensures that victims of trafficking can report their crimes and receive justice. And access to justice, including compensation, is essential for the reintegration and social inclusion of victims and survivors and to prevent their re-trafficking. We at ODR will continue to assist participating states in addressing the low levels of identification and prosecution of trafficking cases by providing policy guidance and capacity building to strengthen national referral mechanisms. This issue will be a key aspect in our forthcoming updated NRM handbook. Survivors of trafficking are a key stakeholder within the multidisciplinary approach to combat trafficking in human beings. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate the Chair in Office for establishing last year the Albanian Advisory Board for Potential and Identified Victims of Trafficking. I am also delighted to tell you that ODIR has just launched a call for applications <clears throat> for our International Advisory Council of Trafficking Survivors. I am sure that it will strengthen our assistance to the participating states in making sure that their anti-trafficking responses are victim and survivor-centered. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I very much hope that this conference will further strengthen the cooperation between, between all anti-trafficking stakeholders. I strongly encourage you to keep the human dimension of this issue at the center of your discussions and of the development and implementation of all anti-trafficking work in the OSC region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Odir and dear Katarzyna for your message and your continuous partnership with the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator here in Vienna and for highlighting in particular uh, the need for victim protection to walk hand in hand with uh, prosecution efforts. This is uh, truly uh, uh, the, the key to making sure that we are holding perpetrators accountable and at the same time supporting victims. Uh, if I could just pause for a brief technical announcement, I would ask all participants um, on uh, line to please uh, remember to switch off your microphones and your cameras, please. Uh, there are several hundred people online now and this will help ensure that we don't have any uh, problems for any of those participating. Thank you so much. Now, uh, let me turn to the first keynote speech, uh, for which we are delighted to have a video address from Ms. Tenzia Narbayeva, Chairperson of the Senate of the Parliament of Uzbekistan and Chairperson of the National Commission on Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. 
I first met Ms. Nurbayeva at a conference for Supreme Court judges in Tashkent, and I was deeply impressed by her engagement on human trafficking in that context. Uzbekistan has shown really remarkable commitment to addressing human trafficking with decisive and comprehensive efforts, and in this regard has proven the crucial importance of engagement coming from the highest levels of government. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome her video contribution to Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the OSCE Special Representative on Trafficking in Human Beings, Mr. Valley and Ritchie, for convening such an important high-level conference in spite of the coronavirus pandemic. Combating trafficking in persons is rightly seen as a priority in most international organizations and countries worldwide. Unfortunately, in spite of the many efforts being made by the international community and existing effective legal mechanisms, this problem continues to exist. Where still, it affects more than just one country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you that in Uzbekistan, the issue of combating trafficking in human beings is being addressed at government level. In recent years, our country has passed 15 pieces of legislation in this area. A Senate-led National Commission on Combating Human Trafficking and Forced Labor has been established by presidential decree, and we also now have a national rapporteur on this issue. The National Commission combines the work of two subcommittees. The Subcommittee on Countering Trafficking in Persons, which is led by the Interior Minister, and the Subcommittee on Combating Forced Labour, which is led by the Minister for Employment and Labour Relations. We have also established regional commissions on countering human trafficking and forced labour, which are led by the heads of local authorities. Now, I'd particularly like to separately note here that civil society is an active participant in the efforts both at the national and regional commissions. To improve our domestic legislation, we've drawn up laws to amend and expand the Uzbek Human Trafficking Act. And it now includes new mechanisms, entirely new mechanisms, to identify and assist victims. This law is due to be examined at an upcoming sitting of the Parliamentary Senate, which should take place this month. Furthermore, active efforts are underway to make additional amendments to the Uzbek Penal Code to bring it into line with the norms of the Palermo Protocol of the 15th of November 20, uh, 2000. And here I would particularly like to thank ODIR and the OSCE's project coordinator in Uzbekistan for their help in harmonizing our national legislation and bringing it into line with international standards. Ladies and gentlemen, we work to analyze in depth uh, what Uzbekistan can do to implement recommendations of international organizations, bearing in mind ILO recommendations as well as those from the US State Department, the Cotton Campaign and Human Rights Watch. We've drawn up a roadmap on improving efforts to counter human trafficking and forced labor. We've also adopted a program of practical steps to protect our citizens, including those who are migrants abroad, and to implement jointly uh, various projects with international organizations. Uzbekistan is working to implement comprehensive social, economic, judicial, legal, and other types of reform by ensuring employment is available to our people and bolstering prevention efforts. We are working to reduce overall crime levels, and this includes human trafficking related crimes. In 2019, 94 crimes were recorded that were related to human trafficking. That represented a 21.6% reduction in comparison to 2018. And 137 members of organized criminal groups were brought to justice in relation to such crimes. As a result of our efforts to combat forced labor in 2019 alone, over 
250 officials received administrative penalties as set out by law. Esteemed forum participants, as you know, each year the US State Department publishes the Trafficking in Persons Report or TIP report, which provides an analysis of the situation in 192 states. In the 2019 report, Uzbekistan remains on the tier two watch list. At the same time, so the US State Department made special note of Uzbekistan's efforts, saying that it, in its opinion, was setting an example to its entire region in combating the issue of forced labor. But we do know very well indeed that the problem of human trafficking and forced labor still exists in Uzbekistan. It's still relevant, and this particularly applies to raising awareness, uh, the fact that we need to continue to improve our legislation and the judicial system, and we need to implement our newly adopted legislation in this area. Mr. Ritchie, once again, I'd like to note the role that was played by the joint conference that was held by the Uzbek High Court and the OSCE in collaboration with the SCO, and which made such a major contribution to bolstering the judicial system to effectively combat human trafficking. Given our special interest in this area, we believe that it's vital for all OSCE participating states to work harder to investigate these crimes and share their experience in the field. It's also vital to to introduce procedures to identify victims of human trafficking and work with international partners so that we can ensure that we are systematic and effective. The role of high courts is crucial in ensuring consistency in the courts and that both court and appeal court judges have an appropriate understanding and interpretation of legislation on combating trafficking in persons. One of the most promising practices when it comes to ensuring um, that judicial practice is unified are the official explanations issued by the High Court for judges. These explanations and clarifications are important when it comes to categorizing crimes um, as trafficking in persons. It's important for judicial procedures and when it comes to examining evidence and approaches to ensuring respect for the constitutional and procedural rights of those involved in court cases especially when it comes to children. Where possible, such explanations and clarifications should be obligatory, especially when they are a resolution passed by the High Court in plenary. I'd especially also like to highlight the need to train law enforcement staff and those working in the judiciary. They need to know more about best international and national practice this should be at the heart of any such training programs. Constant attention also needs to be paid to protecting human rights, issues affecting children and gender issues. In these areas, civil society can play a, an invaluable role and we need to ensure that they can participate. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that at the end of this conference, we will have a set of important recommendations drawn up when it comes to ensuring human rights are respected, when it comes to countering trafficking in persons and establishing mutually beneficial cooperation in this area. So I wish you all every success and good health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Narbayeva. Uh, in particular, um, for making the effort to support us with a opening uh, remarks or keynote remarks, but also for uh, Uzbekistan's tremendous work on combating trafficking for uh, labor exploitation. And your mention right there at the end of engaging civil society, truly commendable work by um, one of the 57 OSC participating states. Allow me now to introduce uh, Mr. Olivier Onidi, Deputy Director General of the Director General Migration and Home Affairs at the European Commission and Acting EU Anti-Trafficking Coordinator. 
Mr. Onidi, we have deeply valued our cooperation with the Office of the EU Anti-Trafficking Coordinator over the last few years, and I'm delighted you are joining us today. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much for, for, this, for this opportunity. Um, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you today. Uh, we value immensely the cooperation we have with the OECE, but, but, but also, more in general, uh, the many important actors that, uh, that you have gathered uh, uh, today. Thank you for keeping this event, uh, despite the uh, circumstances. Uh, these are important moments. These are really important moments uh, to all together assess where we stand uh, on uh, our fight against the trafficking of uh, human beings. Uh, and uh, I think speakers uh, uh, before me uh, have uh, depicted the picture with a lot of objectivity. Uh, if all of us have invested immensely in uh, uh, fighting more effectively this phenomenon, one has to recognize that unfortunately the results are not at the level of uh, uh, our ambition. Um, four points I would like to make and, and directly linked, I believe, uh, with uh, uh, the dedicated thematic of uh, this year's uh, OSC event. I think the first, uh, uh, the first point would be that, uh, uh, and uh, you have, uh, uh, Val, uh, uh, you've mentioned it, uh, uh, we have to deeply root the fight against the trafficking of human beings into our actions uh, uh, dedicated to fight organized crime. It cannot be just a separate chapter. It cannot be one of the many priorities. It needs uh, to be positioned as a central uh, way of uh, uh, fighting crime uh, because we see how many criminals actually use uh, as a main or uh, as an additional way uh, of uh, perpetrating uh, uh, their criminal activities, trafficking of, uh, uh, of people. This is the message that uh, the Commission will convey this Wednesday, in, uh, in two days, uh, within the new uh, security strategy. We have a very, very stronger focus uh, on uh, the fight against organized crime, and within that, uh, the uh, also uh, absolute priority to fight uh, and put all the means uh, uh, against uh, trafficking of human beings. We have uh, modernized considerably the overall legislative framework. You have mentioned the uh, uh, Palermo Protocol, the different aspects of uh, transposing this. We've heard uh, uh, from Albania, from Uzbekistan, I think very strong testimony of the improvements in terms of the overall legislative framework. I believe now is the time to target better implementation of uh, uh, the framework. And uh, here as well, I believe this is a responsibility of, of us, uh, the OEC, uh, other regional organizations, but also states and uh, associated partners, uh, NGOs that are uh, with us today, etc., to actually come with the facts, the facts on uh, the degree of implementation, uh, the degree of criminalization, and uh, the actual effect of the policies that uh, uh, we disclose. In terms of uh, overall implementation of the legislation, but also uh, the different activities that we can directly conduct within uh, uh, the different uh, uh, streams uh, fighting uh, organized crime. We see, for example, in Europe, that trafficking of human beings uh, is uh, uh, central to the overall policy cycle, which organizes the cooperation within the EU uh, uh, on uh, uh, organized crime, but also now with the associated uh, Western Balkan countries. And we see the uh, also gradual and further involvement of some of our agencies like Europol, like Eurojust on these matters. For example, two weeks ago, we disclosed, uh, Europol and Eurojust disclosed the capacity to infiltrate a uh, uh, network used by uh, uh, organized uh, criminals, a dedicated encrypted network, EncroChat, which actually led again uh, to identify a number of uh, organized crime perpetrators and the many links that we uh, have with uh, uh, trafficking of uh, uh, people. Second point is on the technology front. Uh, here as well, we've seen uh, with uh, uh, growing concern 
the speed at which uh, organized criminals uh, use the technology in order to recruit, in order to abuse, but also, and this is the most uh, uh, worrying, in order to hide from uh, uh, law enforcement and uh, uh, judicial uh, uh, forces. And here as well, again, we believe uh, organizations uh, like ours, uh, uh, national governments, need to step up the efforts uh, to cooperate uh, with the tech world, with the internet actors, etc., uh, to identify and to also provide the elements that we need in order to chase uh, those criminals uh, uh, in uh, uh, the virtual world. But we also need to step up the work providing a legal framework that is conducive and helpful to those who are investigating, investigating or those who are um, uh, prosecuting those, uh, uh, those crimes. And here, uh, negotiations that are ongoing uh, in the context of the Budapest Convention in order to facilitate the access to uh, electronic information and overall the modernization of uh, uh, our uh, frameworks in order to get better data, increased uh, uh, speed also in analyzing this uh, data, better evidence, is absolutely fundamental. The third aspect, and here as well, I'm very happy that uh, some speakers have already hinted at this. Uh, there is not only uh, the uh, provision of uh, uh, human beings uh, uh, for uh, trafficking acts, but there is also the use. And on the use, uh, we have at least uh, in uh, uh, the last years seen quite a number of very helpful, very interesting uh, uh, initiatives taken by a number of countries in order to criminalize, criminalize seriously the use of all forms of uh, uh, trafficking of uh, human beings. And this is again, one of the areas I believe we have to put more focus on. One of the areas where uh, the new commissioner for internal affairs, Ms. Johansson, uh, deliberately said that at EU level, we will do the utmost to table a dedicated EU legislative framework in order to tackle this and uh, uh, allow for a minimum level of harmonization in all the EU, uh, allowing for the criminalization of the use of all four sorts of uh, and forms of uh, trafficking. And then finally, I'm sorry if I've, I've been a, a bit long, we also have to continuously adapt our policies to those most vulnerable. And here again, the importance to have a very strong gender uh, aspect in whatever we do, a lot also of emphasis on children. Uh, uh, two speakers uh, early on have uh, uh, underlined this. We have to do even more in protecting those, uh, uh, preventing those uh, to uh, be uh, uh, abused in such trafficking elements, but also uh, to, to take dedicated policies, especially geared at, uh, at, uh, at them. For example, in the new migration framework we will be proposing, there will be a very strong uh, emphasis in better protecting, better identifying early uh, uh, individuals, young individuals uh, uh, that are uh, being brought uh, uh, to be uh, abused through trafficking. So these are just a few examples of where we'd like to put the, the emphasis. Again, we commend immensely uh, your work, the work of uh, ODC as well, that was represented by her Executive Director General. We'll continue to closely uh, work with you, and we wish, of course, uh, uh, you all the best for this very important event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Onidi, for your uh, fantastic uh, presentation and uh, highlighting a number of the issues which uh, are certainly at the top of the agenda of the OSCE as well, including organized crime, uh, combating the intersection of uh, the misuse of technology to facilitate trafficking, the users and also trying to uh, pay strict attention to the gender dynamics as well as the trafficking of children. Um, uh, we, we value the cooperation with the, with the EU and thank you very much for your presentation. As Mr. Onidi said, we must keep up the effort uh, despite the challenges that we are facing across the OSC. And uh, one of the most important things to keeping up this effort is for uh, champions to come along and to advocate on the behalf of this topic. And in this regard, I wanted to take a moment before our coffee break to thank 
uh, the Albanian chairmanship for being a champion in this regard. Uh, they have uh, brought the topic of combating trafficking in human beings to the top of the OSCE's agenda for 2020, a year when we are not only celebrating the Palermo Protocol's 20th anniversary, but also the 20th anniversary of the Alliance. And in this regard, uh, this has brought the uh, appropriate attention to this very serious topic. Uh, as we just heard a few moments ago from Minister Leshai, they have also backed this up with concrete initiatives that are taking their anti-trafficking uh, response to the next level. And so I wanted to thank in particular Ambassador Hassani, uh, who has been a strong advocate in this building and outside for combating trafficking in human beings and for our, our great partnership with the Albanian chair over this year. Thank you so much to them for their hard work on this topic. And with that, we will take a short coffee break now. For those connected online, let me uh, please make one request. Please do not leave the session, uh, as otherwise you will go back into the waiting room and it will cause quite a bit of um, challenge for, for my team. Uh, so we will display on your screen the Twitter wall, which will have some of your comments and questions. And you can see comments and questions from across the community. Um, who are participating in this. We, we will be back in half an hour at, uh, excuse me, let me just, we will be back, we'll be back in 45 minutes at 1400 Vienna time to dive in to this topic uh, for panel number one and look at the nature and the scope of the problem we're facing. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you for joining us and see you in just a little while.